Hello, LSD, and welcome. Um, I'm coming to you from the sunny beaches of North Carolina today. I've got a, a makeshift setup with my uh, beach furniture, so please excuse any dog barks in the background. Um, I've also got Jared Frank from our team, who all of you know, um, who will come in if, if I have any Wi-Fi issues, but knock on wood, fingers crossed, I don't think that will be the case. Um, as you know, we've been doing a number of these virtual panels lately, and a perspective that we haven't brought to the forefront quite yet is that of those that are purchasing, managing, and organizing uh, hospitality tickets and events um, in coordination with your teams and venues. Um, so this was a perspective that we thought would be very valuable right now. Um, some of our leagues are starting to get a restart. And so it's an exciting time and, and hopefully we can provide you some tangible, tangible takeaways from today's discussion. Um, we've got a 45 minute time slot. Feel free to ask questions throughout and I will try to address them both during and after the set of questions I have for both of our panelists. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to each of our panelists to introduce themselves. So. Um, we'll start with Morgan, and Morgan, could you provide um, sort of a 30-second overview of yourself and then maybe 30 seconds to your firm and how, how the uh, attendees can get in touch with you if they'd like? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me today, Max. My name is Morgan Denton, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Event Finders. We help fill the gaps in corporate ticketing. Our mission is to eliminate the dreaded question on both sides of the aisle of what about those empty seats? And we do that in a variety of ways, by helping companies manage their season tickets, by really understanding what their ROI is. Is it brand experience? Is it client development? Um, and utilizing the tickets for that. We also help companies that don't have season seats or don't own suites find opportunities to still engage and use those uh, tickets. And then we work with teams as a third party service or a white glove service to um, make sure that usage is happening. So if you've got a sponsor that's in year three of a deal um, and they're not using their tickets, how do we help you increase their usage by truly understanding the customer needs so that renewal is easier for you on the team side? I've been in ticketing for 16 years. I've worked across multiple sports, uh, concert promoters, ticketing agencies, um, you name it, I've, I've done it. I've always had a job with the walkie talkie. So uh, by taking all those different perspectives and putting it into our company, we really try to fill those gaps on corporate ticketing. Stephanie. Hey there, thanks for having me, Max. Um, I'm Stephanie Lewis. I am the Director of Marketing Business Development at Monk Wilson Mandela. We are a technology-focused law firm. Um, we are full service. We do everything from intellectual property, patents, trademarks, um, corporate labor and employment, um, to high stakes litigation. Um, so, but we have offices everywhere from Dallas to LA to Austin and Miami. So being coast to coast um, with a global reach, uh, we do um, tickets and events everywhere. So my job with the firm is really um, engaging with the clients, motivating attorneys to stay connected, finding ways that we can engage um, and bring a different way of, of branding ourselves um, both to the region and to our clients and networks. Morgan's been very helpful too in finding us some other tickets when he can't have them. <laughs> and how, how can somebody get in touch with you? Um, LinkedIn's the best way. Um, you could always uh, find us at monkwilson.com too. I'm on the website there as well. Perfect. And Morgan, did we hear from you on how to get in touch? So LinkedIn works or my email is real simple. It's morgan at eventfindersusa.com. Perfect. Thanks. So I want to set the stage now and um, we'll get into some specifics about suites and hospitality in just a minute. But I want to set the stage because COVID has thrown a loop into marketers and event planners, particularly in-person events um, plans uh, this year. Um, and there's still a lot of ambiguity around it. So the first question is, and we'll start with Stephanie on this one, how has your focus um, within the marketing and event space changed since COVID? And um, we had historically obviously done a lot of live um, person events and hosting, whether it be internal or external events with clients. Um, but since lockdown, we've had to make a shift and get more creative in um, our outreach efforts, whether it be 
um, client gifting, and we did a lot of um, COVID care packages that we sent um, a branded box of chocolates with um, some wine to, you know, work from home situations to kind of stay engaged um, with clients that way. We've also shifted to virtual happy hours um, that we rebranded as, you know, contracts and cocktails to kind of give them, um, you know, something to discuss, you know, ask their most important questions over quarantine from a legal perspective while, you know, making quarantinis from one of our um, corporate partners who's a craft mixologist by hobby, um, but also very engaging in a Zoom call. So um, it worked to, you know, showcase what we can do from a legal aspect, but then also in just kind of getting them, you know, engaging in something that wasn't like a work Zoom call as well. Morgan, how about yourself? Any of your clients, um, what have they been sharing with you as it relates to changes in their roles? Sure. So things are definitely changing. A lot more Zoom calls, but um, as you know, they're here to stay for a while. We have to find some intentionality behind it for clients to engage and interact with them. Uh, companies still have the same goals to either retain clients or develop new business relationships. And so how do they take that um, from the setting of a live event and, and put it virtual. Um, we're seeing a lot of people mailing things to clients, maybe to Stephanie's point, a uh, mixology class and people get the packages in the mail or if they're hosting a lunch and learn, they're doing a DoorDash gift card where clients are getting $25 to buy lunch on that company. Um, it really is just in helping uh, to increase the intentionality and the participation. Building on that, and I'll ask this question specifically to Stephanie in your role, because you're not just marketing, you also have an aspect of business development in your role as well. How are you spending your time now? Is it, is it a different level of proportion in the past dedicated to certain things? Um, or is there something you're spending time on that's like totally new to you? You know, I would have thought that with um, some of the venues in lockdown that it would have, you know, freed up all this time to do these, you know, wish list of um, stuff. But really, we've refocused um, some of those external events internally. Um, we're one of the fruit few law firms um, nationally that has actually moved forward with an in-person clerkship program. So some of those efforts and time that would have been spent um, in client events, uh, you know, or sports um uh, venues are now in recruiting and internal events um, that we've hosted both here and with clients and friends of the firm um, that have open air venues that we can still abide by um, the restrictions that way to host. Um, but we actually have also spearheaded um, a few different ad um, and digital campaigns uh, that have been helpful to, you know, just keep momentum going um, to do e-blasts for our client alerts that typically go out. Um, we have seen an increase in just the COVID alerts that we've sent out to like our labor and employment, um, you know, clients. And then there's some corporate clients with the PPP loans, you know, and what information needs to be outsourced. So um, it's still event heavy. It's just a different type of event. Um, and, you know, to planning the virtual events too, you know, there's coordination efforts in the packages that we send out to prep for that. And so it really hasn't slowed down. And, you know, we're, we're grateful to be as busy as we are. And a lot of our clients have been um, as grateful to be engaged, you know, with whether it be, you know, receiving a package at home versus, you know, the wine and dining treatment that they're used to out and about. And as we segue into the, the part of the discussion that'll get into some specifics as it relates to premium and hospitality and sports and events, I'd like to ask each of you, what's your overall point of view about bringing clients to in-person events in the year 2020? Um, we'll start with you, Morgan. Sure. So what we're seeing is it really a mix, um, a mix regionally, a mix across different industries, et cetera. So um, for us, one industry that's still buying and planning on in-person events is auto. Um, we just see that those clients are ready to go. They want to be in person and, and they're, they're still actively looking. Um, other industries, maybe the financial side, the mortgage side are a little bit more cautious. We have a client who's 
not national, but they're very large regionally. And um, in a conversation, they recently said they're going to be the followers, not the leaders in this field, um, which for that company is, is very unique because they have um, employee interest groups. They've worked from home for years. Like they're very progressive. So um, it's really more industry for us. And then, of course, there's a regional aspect, too. Um, and the second part is, what is their sport that they normally fall into? Are they normally, you know, baseball heavy? Or are they normally football heavy? And, and what's an actual realistic option for them? But um, a lot of differences between industry and regional we're seeing. Stephanie, how about yourself? It sounded like um, you're hopeful that there will be some limited capacity events that you're able to, to get to this year. Yeah, I would say we're hopeful. Um, you know, some of the feedback that we received, um, just talking from an internal recruiting standpoint, um, as far as bringing people back into the office from work from home, um, the clerks were really excited that they had the opportunity to come, you know, engage and feel the, you know, culture and environment of the firm, um, you know, because those dynamics are kind of harder to relay over virtual or remote opportunities. Um, and I think the same goes for client relationships, too. While, you um, I've really been impressed with a lot of our attorneys and expanding outside of their, you know, comfort zones um, to get comfortable going virtual. Um, I think a lot of them are uh, safely anxious <laughs> to um, want to uh, approach getting back um, into the a new swing of things. Um, and some of that will be, you know, just finding smaller connection groups, you know, starting out because, um, I think while we have been at the forefront in leading some of that, um, it's, you know, without, definitely without, um, you know, we've done all the due diligence to make sure that that was the safest um, option for us, you know, so it's a fine line to walk in wanting to be at the forefront, but then also wanting to and make sure that you're doing everything you can to make everybody else comfortable. So, um, but again, you know, thinking of the, the regionality of things, um, being in Texas, I'm sure we'll get to experience it before some. Yeah. Is there, as a, a second question to, to some of the things you mentioned, is there sort of an all clear signal um, or a go ahead that, that your firm would look to in terms of now we know that it, that it might be okay to start getting back to in person or Morgan on your end? Are there any of your clients in the leader space as opposed to followers who are basing their decisions off of some sort of metric or, or is everybody just waiting on news? We're having to maintain so much flexibility with ours um, where I think that kind of makes it feel like we're just as busy as before because it's with things being so up in the air, you know, we can't really plan that far out, you know, and we've actually had to make some last minute adjustments to plans that we had, you know, say for an event that was supposed to be in our library here that we had to move outdoors, you know, because it grew in capacity, you know, so um, I don't know if we're waiting for anything. Um, it certainly doesn't feel all clear. I, it, it waves, you know, so I think uh, maintaining flexibility through the ebb and flow of it. Um, is good, but then I think also finding the ways to make the people that you're engaging with comfortable in that too, you know, because a lot of people want to know the plan and exactly what they're expecting going into that, you know, so it's um, partnering with the right um, clients and friends of the firm in our case. Um, we've kind of enhanced some of those relationships uh, where, you know, it's benefited their businesses um, and also made us feel comfortable in bringing people out. So some of those are a little bit unique, but I think important to be mindful of where we can continue some of that normalcy. And as we transition to some more specific questions here, it might be helpful for each of you to provide a little bit of insight, Stephanie, in your case, the, the types of events and sports and venues you're involved with um, as far as your hospitality scope. And then Morgan, some of your clients, who do you have experience working with on the the events and venue side. So Stephanie, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so again, you know, we're coast to coast. So um, we certainly do um, sponsored uh, organizational events, um, coast to coast. Uh, for more sports um, oriented events, we do have relationships with Dallas Cowboys, Dallas Mavericks and Dallas Stars. Um, that provides us uh, a venue or suite options for uh, those events. We do uh, third-party concerts a lot of the times, both at American Airlines Center 
in um, Cowboys Stadium. Um, but then definitely not limited to, to that. Um, there's a lot of uh, one-off events, both suites and just concert tickets that we do, um, to, you know, especially for premium events and client groups. Morgan? Sure. So we work with an array of people. It could be a, you know, a business owner that has two tickets and doesn't have time to manage it to a company similar in Stephanie's size that has multiple offices um, and just needs you know, some flexibility with what they're looking for here and there. Um, but I'd say our average client is going to be about 100 employees and they've got you know, a suite or four to six tickets um, within a single market or maybe two markets. Um, and the team sizes or the number of teams vary just on the markets. So are you or any of your clients still buying hospitality? We talked about um, how you're looking at hospitality for the rest of 2020, but moving forward, um, have you seen any buying trends right now? Morgan? So the trends that we've seen has been more in the client gifting. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, whether it's mailing you know, them a cocktail kit or sending them lunch, something within that realm that they can put a tangible item and not just an email of a Zoom invite. Um, so a lot of that money is going towards client gifting and then the internal too. Um, how are they keeping their employees engaged? Are they sending them a, you know, a care package or things of that nature? So those are the two biggest uh, areas that we're seeing the spending go to. Stephanie, you mentioned turning to some deeper partnerships with clients in a, a call we had before. Can you build on that? Yeah, so um, from the firm's relationships, whether it be, um, you know, from a, a startup company that has cool client gifts or, you know, K um, speaking local, Kate Weiser is a chocolatier who's one of um, our clients, an amazing, um, you know, gifter. <laughs> you know, she has amazing client packages and can actually brand the chocolates, you know, with our logo and stuff. So um, we can create different inserts for different clients that way and send those out with a bottle of wine. Um, we do different relationships with some restaurants and um, breweries and wineries um, that we've done some both, you know, recruiting clerk events and client events with um, that, you know, you know, obviously with the lockdown, they've been hurting. Um, and so it provides, you know, better business uh, for them as well. Um, we could get larger groups, um, you know, for those outdoor venues, um, you know, if we spread around some of that too. So, um, that's kind of where we just help kind of give it back where we can't, we were, could be mindful of clients that have businesses out there. We definitely try to, you know, circulate our business there first. On the gifting side, we've got a lot of vendors at our annual conference who focus on gifting. It's a big category for folks in the premium seating space um, around certain events during the year, also renewal season. Are there any other particular uh, gifts either of you have received or sent that have like had a, a high conversion rate, whether that's conversations, just responses, anything else that's really stood out? Um, the COVID care packages that we were sending out with the Kate Wise or chocolates and the wine bottles um, actually got her a lot of business generation um, from people who had received that saying, oh my gosh, we need to do this for our company. Um, you know, so that was kind of a nice um, aside from that. Um, the uh, quarantini cocktail hours with um, our partner here were popular because we did, we sent out little um, branded mixer kits to those client recipients um, that were meaningful. Um, you know, so I think just when they're not just, like you said, receiving an email with a Zoom link or, you know, something else that is a little bit more meaningful. Um, we, we're working on some travel safety kits right now, um, looking forward to when we can travel again um, and share with, you know, either clients coming in or out, you know, just to try to help, you know, embrace the new normals, I guess. So I'm seeing a... Um question from the audience and that is this could be to either of you um so how have you maintained exclusivity within premium engagement um and it, what has been the most successful engagement initiative you've seen when it comes to events and gifting we just touched a little bit on gifting 
Um, but Morgan, this might actually be a segue into a question I was going to ask um, as it relates to unique solutions that you've had proposed to you within or outside of sports. Sure, absolutely. So I think on the gifting side, one thing to keep in mind is hopefully you're, as a team, you have all this information about your customers, right? You know their kids' names, you know what they like. And so if you can incorporate the family aspect too and maybe one of those gift packages, that's huge because you're touching base on really connecting with those um, clients and those um, you know people that are in your world. And it's a true touch of understanding and being intentional. And, and we keep saying that word, but I think that's a really big word to focus on. Um, one of the teams that we work with um, on helping with some of their clients' um, usage and renewals and things of that nature um, is we have kind of made theme groups for them. And this really operates from wanting to have a player interaction event that we just couldn't pull off because of contracts. And, and here's another element of that, right, is this company that has multiple suites with this team wanted to do a branded event where a player came in and spoke to their clients as a business development. We couldn't pull it off. And, and there's something to be said about the letter of the law and their contracts and everything like that. But getting creative on that we went to their front office who has great personnel, great stories, and we're able to still provide them event. From that, we have now spun other themed events. And that can be, you know, an account rep who loves running and you make a, a virtual running group and there's a check-in or you have a um, track my run page and everyone's, you know, on the same login and they're able to still kind of network, but have a common goal. Or is it, you know, your chef uh, through your concessionaire leads cooking classes or, you know, somebody's really into gardening and, and there's a garden club, whatever it is, this is a great way to utilize your staff and your front office to really connect and be intentional with your clients, with your prospects. And Teams that use this time to build their brand, not to focus on sales, but to build their brand within their own clients, those are going to be the winners at the end of the day. Yeah, I really like the theme concept and the intentional is a, an important point. And teams more than ever now, they're gathering more and more data on their clients that they can use for, for some of the scenarios you mentioned. Um, what are some of, and please keep the questions coming. Um, I'm going to try to get to as many of them as possible. What are some of your expectations uh, around teams and events policies as it relates to contracts and options for events that are postponed or canceled? This is something um, that both of you have addressed in a, a prior call to prep for this panel. I'll start with you, Stephanie. Sure. Um, I think the expectation is generally, um, you know, about receiving proper credit for any lost canceled events um, and ensuring that, you know, we receive, um, you know, any, say, upgrades or certain amenities to make sure that any postponed events are, you know, utilized to, you know, the fullest capacity. Um, I know one thing that, you know, we're curious to know um, is how it's going to look moving forward with, you know, limited capacity and limited tickets in the upcoming events that we're not going to be able to use. So we're already at a loss in, you know, lost opportunity to engage, but then now we're already looking at fewer opportunities to engage, you know, so making those the most impactful that we can, um, you know, is going to be even more important. But I do think that's where we have a benefit in having a more frequent events with virtual and in-person um, opportunities, because, you know, where some, we tear those off, off for our needs where, you know, some are more premium client levels, but then we don't lose out in engaging with others that are just as meaningful, just not as, you know, centric to the business. And before we go to Morgan, uh, what type of communication from the teams and venues, Stephanie, is helpful? Or, or how frequent? Um, I would think anything right now is helpful. Um, we, in the last few weeks, have received some from just about every venue or team that we work with. Um, some of it has been a little bit more vague than others. Um, but I think just anything in what their plan is or what they're looking out towards is helpful. Um, and assessing a plan of action would be nice. Um, the crickets aren't, especially as we're fielding questions in, you know, how much is, you know, still lingering here, you know, and how much do we have here? 
Um, so we've had, a, we haven't necessarily changed how we've um, looked towards them, but we have shifted in how we're monitoring those events. Um, just because we do have a lot remaining out there that would have already been executed by now. Um, but it has also provided some flexibility in those budgets to allow us to do more creative campaigns. So Morgan, back to you as it relates to both the expectations around teams and events communication with cancellations and, and potential credits, and then also uh, any other stories as far as best practices in communication. Sure. So on the communication side, I think, you know, often it's good, but make sure there's some value to it, right? Like we all understand there's some vague questions and not everyone has all the answers, but be transparent about that. That's a big thing we're hearing is, um, and that applies to the credits too. You know, I think if you look at some of the ticketing systems and how they've had to struggle with people being upset about refunds and timing is just be transparent um, and, and know that, you know, your transparency isn't going to work for everyone, but being able to still talk to them and actually, you know, take things under advisement um, and really look at things case by case is a win. Um, for events that aren't happening, you know, and you're pushing credits, make it a reasonable offer um, for those people that are losing their money and losing this business opportunity because, you know, most of our clients use this for a business opportunity to develop clients or maintain relationships. So they're struggling too in a different front and they're oftentimes already out money. So just be aware of that. Keep that in the back of your mind um, when you're having conversations with people. I think if you take that tone and approach, um, it, it works a little bit easier on both sides of the table. Everyone kind of is able to come to a compromise. But we've seen everything from, you know, possible upgrades to premium locations for missed events or trade out events that are similar. Um, I don't, you know, no one's expecting you to give away the arena, right? We're not giving keys to everybody because they own two tickets and, and they missed an event. But what we're doing is we're making sure that people feel valued and have an understanding of what's happening and where they're going to see their value in the future. Yeah. And, and as it, as sort of a, something else that we thought about is, there's a lot of questions that come with all of these things and you both may have frequently asked questions that you get um, that you'd like to bring up to the teams in the sort of forum like this. Are there frequently asked questions that you're getting from your clients, Morgan or Stephanie in your case, that you're just curious about it? It might only be one or two. I'm sure we've heard a lot of the same questions over and over again related to masks and sanitization. But are there any one-off questions that have stuck out to you? The biggest one to me right now being, um, you know, a suite holder is um, not so much the safety once they're in the suite, but the limited capacity once we're in the suite. You know, how many tickets per event, you know, are we looking um, at losing? And how will those be made up eventually, you know? Um, that's kind of the biggest lingerer we have right now. Um, I think everyone's kind of embraced the fact that it will look different as far as, you know, food and beverage options. Um, so I think that flexibility is fine. Um, but just really having answer or guidance in how we can be looking to allocate those tickets down the road um, by quantity and quality is important. Morgan? Yeah, to echo off what Stephanie said, very similar. A lot of questions about concessions and how, you know, how to move around once you're in the venue. It's easier to social distance outside where you can space people through a parking lot and you know they have certain entrances to go in, but once they're inside, how do they buy a beer? How do they take an elevator to their suite? Um, how do they, you know, where do they go to get in line for the restroom? And then even on the food and beverage, you know, are cup holders gone? Because if you've got someone walking through the aisle and their gene touches your beer, is it now contaminated? Lots of things on that front once you're in the stadium more than the scanning to get in. I think, you know, mobile ticketing has been around enough. Um, and even though there's still lots of options and changes that need to happen on the premium side of mobile ticketing, um, it, it's enough that people have a base understanding, but everything else is so new and there's just no real guideline that people are, are curious. Um, and I think, again, food and bathrooms are kind of the two biggest things. And I got a question in the queue that I want to backtrack to something we were talking about before, gifting Something we're hearing at the association is a lot of teams have either budget freezes on gifting spend 
or um, definitely reduce spend. Um, so are there any ways that you've seen teams be able to connect without a big expense? I know we've uh, touched on a lot. Both of you have mentioned, Stephanie, in the past, uh, a mixologist at your firm. Um, Morgan, I think you mentioned player calls. We've seen a lot of those. Are there anything that sticks out? We've had a good experience, um, you know, utilizing some player experiences, you know, or upgrades um, with, you know, just getting the backs behind the scenes, behind uh, backstage kind of views of what goes on. Um, but, you know, aside from that, I don't know if there's a whole lot that we've been privy to that is an option from our end of things. Um, but I do know from some of the ones who are the ones renewing the budgets and looking at it, the client gifting that they've received before they are mindful of <laughs> and do kind of keep track of, um, which, you know, doesn't necessarily matter, you know, to the ones we do a different gifting when we bring in people to the suite, but the ones making the commitment and finding which ones they want to, you know, make our steadfast uh, options, you know, certainly are a little bit more important. So there's still some room for opportunity on that front, Morgan, anything else or um, should we move on to the next question? Yeah, so just real quick. So everyone has a gift shop and obviously we know things aren't free, but you do have resources and assets. And again, not everyone wants a million t-shirts, but you know, if you develop a running club that one of your account reps puts together and you've got 20 people that participate in it and after they do a virtual 5K, they get a shirt and a you know $10 credit to use next year. Those are all things that you have and they're not crazy expensive and it also gives them opportunities to use it in the future, right? So you're continuing to build that relationship and keep that relationship. Um, there, there's just opportunities. I really would um, encourage you to look to your front staff and some of their interests and some of their expertise too on hobbies um, and finding ways to engage um, on that personal level. And that's a perfect segue into my next question, Morgan, because this next question asker would love if a team had a wine club for him. This is the ALSD's very own Bill Dorsey. Um, he wants to know about budgets. So has your budget changed at all for now and in the future? Is there a trend to go away from annual leases to per event suite sales or also per event, you know, club tickets, et cetera? Perfect. Hi, Bill. Um, so I think there's a couple things here. Um, some of our clients are repurposing towards gifting or, you know, they have budgets where uh, if they're public firms, they have to use it or they lose it. So um, some of the private ones are cutting back. But so there's a total mix um, on the um, long term. I think you know, ticketing was kind of ripe for a change, especially the premium world in my mind. Um, I sold premium for nine years. I get it. Everyone wants that five year, 10 year deal, but companies over the last few years have been more and more hesitant to sign up for that. I don't know if necessarily you're going to see a giant change in companies saying, I'm not signing a full, uh, full year. I'm only taking three suites. Um, I think what you'll see is the, you know, people aren't signing three year deals um, without reading the, you know, wording much closer. All of us, I think that buy premium got a little complacent on reading some of the contracts and that'll change and, and the contracts will have to change after this too. Um, so that's a big thing there, but you know, ticketing needed premium needs a change in a lot of ways. Um, obviously nothing this drastic across our whole industry, but again, this is a great time for teams to kind of rebrand their experience with internally by talking to clients, by gaining some really insightful knowledge during this downtime um, and figuring out what programs truly work for them and, and create some awesome opportunities to launch a new brand, launch a new product um, and launch a new, you know, agreement for that's, you know, friendly on both sides. Stephanie, anything to add there? Um, from a law firm perspective, uh, we have a different uh, level of expectation and client service where I don't see us deterring from having uh, long-term arrangements, um, but that's also just what we're accustomed to. Um, I do see that shifting to include more one-offs um, and kind of, you know, whim, whimmy um, events that aren't necessarily 
as planned. Um, but their investment um, and the relationships um, and history and us having, you know, our particular suite and, you know, it's a branded suite, um, you know, and it's a premium location, those type of things, I don't see them giving up. But I had to Morgan's credit, uh, you know, we're a law firm, we were already reading the agreements carefully. Um, I do think we will definitely be, um, you know, making some certain addendums <laughs> as needed to uh, ensure that uh, we can, you know, maximize those uh, relationships and, um, you know, event potential to really uh, kind of, you know, keep that going to status quo um, post COVID. Staying with Stephanie, how about the approval process um, as far as buying and utilizing? The approval process hasn't changed, um, but the utilization process, I would say, has. Um, we still maintain the exclusivity, um, but we have opened up some um, different channels of events to include um, more internal recruiting retention um, opportunities. Uh, again, utilizing friends of the firm and client relationships, um, you know, whether it be we did like a succulent building class, you know, there's a, the, the painting team building events that we've done, um, which can all be done virtual and in person. Um, so those have helped us, uh, you know, stay connected both between offices um, and, you know, clients, you know, all over the place. Morgan, with your clients, anything on the approval or utilization? And then uh, after you answer that, I've got a question from the audience. Not so much on the approval right now. I think that might come later um, with contracts being re-signed in, in the future years. Um, utilization, some companies are going to start using internally before they invite clients back just to kind of test out the waters. Um, but nothing life-changing, just a few changes up front. Okay, so the question from the audience is, and it, it may be uh, too early to tell right now, um, but this is specifically to Morgan. Um, have you seen a shift in comfortability from your clients that typically are okay with good bowl seating or club seating with shared space options to now only wanting private suites so they can control the space a little more? Sure. So we have seen some changes in people um, going from premium bowls up to a suite option. Um, that's a big conversation we have with people. Um, I will say once we kind of walk through it and you talk about some of the other elements of getting to the suite level, as I mentioned earlier, like how many people can be in an elevator? Do you clean it every time an elevator goes up and down? Stuff like that. It almost leads to more questions um, and we kind of start back where we were in the beginning, um, but it is definitely a conversation topic that we're having with clients. Here's a quick easy one to, to tag on to that. Another question from the audience. Any clients who are not allowing their employees to be entertained at events right now. Have you heard any of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. We are. Um, again, some people are starting internally for contracts that they already have and paid for and, and you know, don't want to use, lose the tickets. Some of them are open to selling um, to get ready, you know, to not have that on them. Um, but some companies are, are definitely pushing to 2021 spring or summer, um, which honestly might be the first time we have an event anyways. Right. So for the larger scale ones. So um, but that is definitely in the policies that we're seeing in some of our companies. Um, kind of that middle to large company versus our smaller ones. Our smaller ones aren't taking that dramatic of a stance yet, but they also are smaller and have the flexibility to change really quick. Stephanie? Um, we've heard from some clients where, you know, whether it be self-imposed or actually corporate driven um, to quarantine and stay away from, you know, outside events or other, you know, opportunities to connect. Got it. I'm navigating a number of audience questions. So this is great. Um, we touched on this a little, but if you have anything to add, that would be great. Are you continuing the same strategy going forward? This might be specific to Stephanie at first, um, as far as lease um, versus per game rental. 
I would say yes, the same strategy as far as we're not deviating from any relationships that we currently have or ticket allocations. Um, but I would say that we would be enhancing it uh, to include other um, opportunities. We've really um, received great feedback from more activity driven events, uh, which are, you know, when you're watching a game or a concert aren't necessarily in line. So I think that's been one benefit that we've um, seen from having to get creative uh, in how we engage with clients. Um, but I think our strategy for utilizing tickets will be stronger um, in just the relationships that we've cultivated and getting the attorneys comfortable in who they're reaching out to. Um, having to go virtual has really um, expanded, you know, their pools and how they're, you know, sourcing to grow relationships. And so um, we'll probably be a little bit busier in, you know, we, we do theme events as well, too. So to what Morgan was saying earlier, you know, kind of finding different groups to um, tier these clients off in will be important. Um, same with cross-selling partner relationships um, and par uh, practice groups to really draw in the right audiences at the right time. And Morgan, you already touched a little bit on some of the holistic changes in your clients' perspectives as far as strategy goes. Um, another question from the queue, mobile ticketing. Um, some companies do not allow third party providers to have access to the data. This applies a lot in the financial space. Um, not able to share who may have uh, attended a game in your suite or club seats. Um, financial, uh, next part of the question, financial institutions are telling us this. Is this a concern with you do you track ROI for ticket usage? Stephanie, is that an issue at the law firm at all? Morgan, is this ever a concern that gets brought up? We definitely track um, how our tickets are used and who's using them, um, but it hasn't been an issue as far as us having to do, you know, any backtracking to, you know, confirm that, or we haven't received any, um, you know, client questions and, you know, using the mobile tickets. For the most part, the convenience factor, you know, outweighs, um, you know, anything else that we've received from it. Morgan, and then after that, I'll, we've got a three or four minutes left here. So I'll do some quick hitters of what's, what's to come next. Yeah, I think that's a great point for the financial side. And it's definitely industry specific that have an issue with mobile ticketing within their own internal audit system or their own company policies. So, um, you know, I think, again, ticketing was kind of ripe for some changes on the premium side. And this is one thing that while everyone's trying to eliminate paper tickets, some of the suites you, you might have to keep with them. Um, and having, again, that flexibility and that intentionality with your conversations with your customers, they can really explain this, um, you know, a lot of it is who's your customer and for that sales rep that, you know, it enters in Arctic, that it was transferred and everything. That's great data for a company, but there is some privacy that needs to be respected on the client side. So the final two questions I have that I'll, I'll pair up to each of you to answer at once is what challenge, it's a generic one, what challenges and opportunities do you foresee? Um, and then do you have any ideas specifically of how teams could help transition their clients back to events? Um, so I'll leave it to one of you to unmute yourselves and uh, kick us off on that one. Sure, I'll start off here. So <laughs> um, I think, you know, it, it's like I said earlier, it's time to build your brand within your clients right now. This is an opportunity for teams. Um, if you have, you know, a CRM system that has blank spaces about their interests, about their family, those are times to fill this information so that you can have true conversations. Um, we understand that teams have had to furlough employees, that, you know, staffs are cut. So it's not necessarily a, a matter of account ownership. It's a matter of reaching out your brand to these customers. I think that's really important to remember at this time. Um, and events will be back. Our clients, you know, they're probably going to go to a sporting event before they go to a concert. Um, a sporting event carries a lot more kind of weight on a, if you look at it in a holistic purpose, right? You went with your family members and yes, you take clients, but you've, you know, watched football since you were a kid. Like it's a whole picture for them. And while everyone has a famous artist or, you know, a 
favorite artist. It's not necessarily the top of mind versus going to a football or a baseball or a hockey game, whatever the sports might be. So there's a lot of wins and a lot of opportunities in this really bad situation. And nobody's discrediting how awful this is across our industry. And, you know, there's that great article out that we've all probably seen and read that says my industry is not coming back like yours. That's very true. But there's a way to be successful and to take this opportunity and turn it into a great 2021. You essentially have six months, five months of lead time to, you know, build those relationships and just make everything a little bit easier for the future. And Stephanie, I'll kick it over to you, acknowledging that that we're here at 145. I'll talk fast. <laughs> um, I definitely agree with what Morgan was saying. Um, Maintaining the connection and taking the time now when there's a lull in the in-person um, events to really um, find out what drives them and, and how you can better engage once you are back live will be really meaningful. Um, for us, I think the relationships that we're, you know, taking efforts to maintain and develop in this time will be even, you know, stronger once we are uh, back live, some of which haven't even been been able to experience those things, you know, uh, pre-COVID. Um, so that would be important. Um, from a, I guess, client um, aspect in y'all's realm, um, teams and venues that show a value in developing and showing loyalty to our relationship will be important too in how we move forward, um, you know, and, and hone in on our event focus. I'll give each of you an opportunity to, to add any other final thoughts. If not, give me, give me a hand raise if you have anything else to add. Okay, it sounds like we've got it covered. We appreciate all the questions from the audience. Um, you will be able to find this recording on ALSD.com within the next week or so. Um, and that will also have access to um, the contact information that each of our panelists provided. So thank you, both of you, Stephanie and Morgan, um, for providing some good insights today. Thank you to all of the ALSD members who listened in, and we look forward to keeping the conversation going with you all over the couple next couple weeks. So thank you very much, and have a good one, guys.